Why not just send a rover equipped with a drone and other hordes of technology to prod and probe the Martian surface? Survey the landscape and give us a much better understanding of what the red planet is today and what it was in the past. If the European Space Agency can land a probe on an asteroid and orbit a spacecraft around it, then you would have to think that NASA could easily send something to Mars better equipped than all previous missions and confirm if Mars once was an Eden much like Earth and not only that, but discover what happened there in the very distant past and if it has significant relations to us humans here on Earth. It has been detected that there is weapons signature on Mars. This means that something happened there in ancient times that was not natural. To create weapons signature, you must first detonate a nuclear bomb, meaning there must have been intelligent life on planet Mars one way or another. Dr. John Brandenburg is a well-known and respected plasma physicist who has worked on plasma technologies, nuclear fusion, and advanced space propulsion for NASA and invented the microwave electrothermal plasma thruster using water propellant for space propulsion. Brandenburg was the deputy manager of the NASA Clementine mission to the moon that discovered water on the moon's poles in 1994. According to Brandenburg, the superabundance of XE-129 in the Mars atmosphere is a nuclear weapon signature indicating that there was a nuclear blast on Mars that completely changed the planet's surface. This is weapon signature. If you match this xenon to the output of a hydrogen bomb, you get a, a very good match. There is only one place in the solar system where in a planetary atmosphere you find anything like the xenon signature of Mars, and that is the part of the U.S. of the atmosphere of the Earth that has changed dramatically since 1945, when we discovered nuclear weapons. This data, which was published shortly after the landing on Mars, shows that For Xenon-129, here's Earth before 1945, or here, actually here it is now, and here it is from air samples before 1945, and you can see 10 roughly 10% of the Xenon-129 wasn't there before. Most of the other xenon isotopes haven't changed at all, but 129 has changed considerably, and that's because of the open-air nuclear tests and also production of plutonium. In fact, if I was really interested, I could probably try and parse out how much plutonium this intelligent species on this planet has made. It is more than you imagine in your worst nightmares. Imagine finding out that your cousins have been stockpiling gun ammunition at their farm. You go out to visit them and you find that the barn is full. Under all the cushions on the couch, there is ammunition. And in all of the desk drawers, there is ammunition. And in the sock drawers, too, under the socks, there is more and more ammunition. The human race has been arming itself for the te to the teeth for a big nuclear war since 1945. And the way we know that is because of this Xenon-129, because of the testing of nuclear weapons and the production of plutonium. This requires fast neutrons. Fast neutrons don't react as well as um, the um, slow neutrons. Now, if we take the weapons Xenon, and mix it with um, like 30-70, or normal Earth and then 70% weapon xenon, we get Mars. And this indicates that on Mars, nuclear reactions occurred which dwarf anything that happened on Earth. Most of the Martian atmosphere is a residue from an enormous nuclear explosion.
Brandenburg says that there are things out there that have been deliberately kept from us. Whether this information has been concealed because the human race is not ready for this information, or that it's just too mind-altering and would change too many things, and because disclosure would threaten various corporate interests of an unknown and socially cataclysmic scale. As we create history and move beyond, more people will become open and aware to the idea that we're not alone, that we've never been alone, and that there is plenty of evidence to prove these claims. John Grunsfield, a five-time spaceflow astronaut and associate administrator of NASA's Science Mission Directive, states the following. The more we observe Mars, the more information we're getting that it really is a fascinating planet. From the Curiosity rover, we know that Mars once was like a planet very much like Earth, with long, salty seas, with freshwater lakes, probably with snow-capped peaks and clouds, and a water cycle just like we're studying here on Earth. Something has happened to Mars. It's lost its water. It was given at a NASA press conference where representatives told the world that there is water on Mars, that it's not the dry, arid planet we imagined it to be and that it was once very much Earth-like, and it still holds the possibility of harboring life. After all, water means life. In that conference, they admit to a drastic atmospheric shift that occurred on Mars, which took it from its Earth-like composition to the one we see today. American rocket engineers are being urged to push their next Mars mission to the limits of technological performance. Space scientists have told NASA they want the agency to dream big to ensure their new robot rover, scheduled for launch in 2020, visits a maximum number of sites to increase chances of uncovering signs of ancient life on Mars. Rock samples, hopefully bearing fossils, would then be left in caches on the Martian surface to be collected several years later and returned to Earth in a complex series of robot sample return missions costing more than $10 billion. Isn't that shocking? How long this would take is unclear. However, in a major space policy speech at Kennedy Space Center on April 15, 2010, then U.S. President Barack Obama predicted a crew Mars mission to orbit the planet by the mid-2030s, followed by landing. For this investment, the scientific community says it wants to have the strongest possible chance of finding signs of ancient Martian life. Hence, its call for the next robot rover to the Red Planet to visit the largest possible number of places where it can collect rocks, hopefully rich in fossils. However, it acknowledges this mission will push the robot vehicle to the very limits of its performance. It would be stunning if they also would send a drone to Buzz about Mars and give us unprecedented views and also a better understanding of structures that may still exist on the fourth rock from the sun, so it may get you a bit excited to learn that by 2021, such a craft will be sent. The Mars helicopter, a small autonomous rotor craft, will travel with the agency's Mars 2020 rover mission, currently scheduled to launch in July 2020, to demonstrate the viability and potential of heavier-than-air vehicles on the Red Planet. The idea of a helicopter flying the skies of another planet is thrilling. The Mars helicopter holds much promise for our future science, discovery, and exploration missions to Mars. It's fitting that the United States of America is the first nation in history to fly the first heavier-than-aircraft on another world. This exciting and visionary achievement will inspire young people all over the United States to become scientists and engineers, paving the way for even greater discoveries in the future. The more young minds that take up positions at NASA with an open mind and a curiosity to discover the cover-ups that may be lurking in the shadowy depths of the NASA archives, then this will give us a better chance of feeling more in touch with what is going on and to not feel like we are blatantly being misdirected with answers all the time. The helicopter also contains built-in capabilities needed for operations at Mars, including solar cells to charge its lithium-ion batteries, and a heating mechanism to keep it warm through the cold Martian nights. But before the helicopter can fly at Mars, it has to get there. It will do so attached to the belly pan of the Mars 2020 rover. 
The altitude record for a helicopter flying here on Earth is about 40,000 feet. The atmosphere of Mars is only 1% that of Earth. So when the helicopter is on the Martian surface, it's already at the Earth equivalent of 100,000 feet. Crazy, right? Also in space news, astronomers have recently made a bizarre discovery on the surface of Saturn's moon, Dione. Dione is covered in mysterious stripes like no other moon in the solar system. The bright long stripes are like nothing astronomers have ever seen. And the strangest part is, no one knows for sure how they got there or what created them. According to astronomers, the stripes orientation, parallel to the equator and linearity are unlike anything else we've seen in the solar system. They're just really bizarre and really exciting when you see something really strange. And you're just trying to figure out what the heck it could possibly be. The bizarre stripes linear vergae on the surface of Dione are generally long, narrow and brighter than the surrounding terrain. The stripes are parallel, seem to overlap other features, and are not affected by topography, suggesting that they are among the younger surface parts of Dione. Their orientation, parallel to the equator and linearity, are different from anything else we have seen in the solar system, suggesting they are something else other than a natural formation, almost reminiscent of the Nazca Lines, which, as you know, is theorized to be an ancient spaceport of sorts. It is considered one of the most baffling mysteries in archaeology. In his book Chariots of the Gods, Von Daniken calls them runways for alien spacecraft that might have visited Earth thousands of years ago. Whereas many researchers and theorists say they were made by a civilization much advanced in agriculture and technology, a culture possibly capable of flight. Miles upon miles of lines, patterns, and shapes in the form of birds, an owl man, a monkey, a spider, and many other creatures etched on the ground, consisting of thousands of lines running as far as 65 kilometers and some larger than two soccer fields. The lines only make sense once they are viewed from up above, because it is only from high up in the air that these creatures drawn on the ground take their shape for what their artists truly intended them to look thousands of years ago. We can call them artists because the huge drawings are of such precision that every detail has been kept in mind. And the best part is that they have been preserved by nature for thousands of years because this is one of the driest and most arid regions on Earth, a hot desert southwest of Peru between the Andes Mountains and the Peruvian coast. But who created these geoglyphs and why? After decades of research, the whole thing, including the idea behind it or the people who made them, is still steeped in mystery. The lines are scattered over 500 square kilometers on an arid plateau, which is around the city of Nazca. About 50 of these huge drawings are concentrated in a specific area of the desert, which is called a pampa. Some of the lines are as narrow as 6 inches, while some of them are as wide as hundreds of meters, including 300 geometric figures and many more are still being discovered all the time. According to legend, the Nazgans lived here around 300 years BC. They left no written record of their civilization, only some pottery was found etched with figures drawn on them, some of them half human and half animal, and fanged. But one thing researchers do know about them, and this is they were farmers. Archaeologists found a subterranean irrigation system, and the Nazgans made use of it. In fact, some archaeologists and anthropologists think that these lines were drawn with the help of large sticks, and the figures drawn were so large because the people could please their gods that lived on the plateaus and took care of their crops. Some also say that they were capable of flying in hot air balloons, so the drawings were helpful also in determining the constellation in the sky. If the Nazcans used sticks to draw these lines, according to some experts, it would have taken 1,000 men to finish the job in 100 years or so. Drawing the lines would not have been difficult as under the surface of the region, soft yellow soil outlines whatever is etched on the ground. Also, the airless climate has preserved this largest and mysterious scratch pad on Earth for thousands of years. 
If these huge drawings were agricultural clocks drawn to help farmers know what time of year was best to sow and to pay homage to the mountain gods, the question then arises as to who these mountain gods were. Or were these lines actually landing strips for UFOs during Earth's ancient past? The truth is probably out there waiting for someone to read between the lines. There is no doubt in our mind that these ancient people were signaling for the return of people who left, who made their lives better while they were around, and upon their departure, things started getting worse. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments section what you are thinking. As always, thank you for watching.